Part 9 of The Birth of Professional Rugby League in Australia Selections from the Sydney Morning Herald 1907 to 1908 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Professionalism in Australian Sport The debate goes on 9th of March to 14th of April 1908 Monday 9th of March 1908 Union and League The Rugby Position the New South Wales Rugby League has formed the following first grade sides for the coming season Balmain, Eastern Suburbs, Western Suburbs, North Sydney, South Sydney, Newtown and Glebe. It is not yet certain whether St George, Manley or Sydney will form the eighth first grade side. It is possible that none of the three will make the eighth side, but that an entirely different plan will be adopted on the suggestion of Mr Giltonan, the Secretary. Mr. Gilton and stated that the league did not wish to exaggerate its success or the strength of its footing. A number of players have joined, he continued, and even some of the university sympathise with us. Balmain has come over in a body, but it would put the league, the players and the public in a false position to give private names. With Headley and Messenger, the league has the best back and the best footballer in Australia, and its members have no doubts of success. By arrangements with the Northern Union, Mr Gilton and said, a New South Wales team would visit England this year, starting in August. The players would be picked in July. They had a £3,000 guarantee and were to get 70% of the gates. An English team was to visit Australia in 1909. It has been definitely decided to play the Northern Union game and the new rules lay it down that no league side may play more than 13 men. It is an absolutely new game, said Mr Giltonan. There is no lining out. If the ball is kicked into touch before it bounces on the field, there is a scrum back where it was kicked from. We have to see if the public will like our game. Mr Thomas from Lancashire, who was in this morning, says it's the best game going. And Mr Gleeson of New Zealand, a solicitor, says that once the public see it, they'll have no time for any other. It is much faster than the union game. As to what the union are going to do, they cannot broaden their rules without breaking away from the English rugby union. Of course they want to widen the rules. Why are they following in our footsteps all the time? Why are they pooling the gates in the country matches? Where is the difference between that and what we do? As for amateur expenses, one English player was allowed £300 for lemons. He was no amateur at eating lemons. HLS in the London Sportsman says that rugby is dead in the south of England, and Cardiff and Swansea are to play in the Northern Union next year. We have no rules about professionals. Our men are not professionals any more than the Australian eleven. A man who declared himself professional would have no status with us. The attitude of the rugby union towards the league is undecided. A prominent member explained, each of the local unions is represented on the council by its own man, and as to what he is going to do or propose, no one can speak except himself. The position is that of a parliament without any government or party. All are utterly hostile to professionalism, but there are three proposals as to how the union should treat it. Most members hold that the union cannot shut its eyes to the one prominent event of the year, professionalism. The movement has not ended even among the prominent players, much less amongst the young and ignorant players. The union should fight the league openly with all its might. Professionalism is beaten in Newcastle and the country, but in the town it is very strong, especially in Balmain. A second proposal is to ignore the league. If men want to play for money, the sooner they play by themselves, the better. Now they are out of the amateur game, others, who would not play with them, members of the city and suburban clubs, for instance, who are joining the Metropolitan Union in numbers, will more than take their place. If the people love the game for the game, they will not play it for money. If they love it for money, then whatever the union might do, the game is dead. The game of thirteen aside or ten aside is a different game altogether. The Australian rules were ignored in New South Wales, and they did not survive. Thirdly, those whose districts have chiefly lost in men through professionalism propose to broaden the union rules wherever they think there is any legitimate grievance, without doing what the English Rugby Union says may not be done. 
of these three courses there is little doubt the union will have to take the first to fight professionalism may advertise it but members think that going round and talking to young players is not enough the union will probably decide to give in black and white a clear statement to the country parts of the stand it takes summing up the position it is clearly the hand of the league to make the union enforce its rules strictly and disqualify large numbers it is the hand of the union to broaden its rules as far as it can without breaking the english affiliation wednesday the eleventh of march nineteen hundred and eight league football north sydney club the general meeting of the north sydney district rugby league football club was held in the masonic hall north sydney on monday march the second mr e m clark m l a occupied the chair mr odbert the secretary addressed the meeting regarding the progress of the club since its formation in his remarks he mentioned that everything had been satisfactorily arranged for large and commodious training quarters and judging by the large enrolment of players the north sydney club was going to be a pronounced success regarding junior players under the league all ground fees would be paid by the league and in addition to which the north sydney district league club would provide for training accommodation it had also been decided that the district club give a set of gold medals to the premier team in the northern district and this would also apply in the case of second juniors mr hoyle president of the new south wales rugby league dealt fully on the constitution of the league the following were elected officers patron mr e m clark m l a vice-patron alderman l mcmurdo j p president mr j a fennelly vice-presidents alderman p mcmanus messrs p w dunn j p c dunn cecil mcmurdo e moss c ford r w heather d macdonald charles white r friend and j e blue joint on secretaries messrs h f odbert and w hedge on treasurer alderman m mcmurdo general committee messrs d lutcher abercrombie glanville e boland j Deverer, c heimrich w kendall and f heckland at the close of the meeting there was a further enrolment of members and a number of subscriptions were received union and league rugby to the editor of the herald sir your article on monday in treatment of the above question is very fair to both of the opposing forces in the first place i may state i am not connected in way with either body but as an old player and follower of the grand old game with your permission may i crave a few lines as to the dispute it cannot be denied but things have been somewhat disturbed through the crisis and new arrangements are being made for the coming season are not the union authorities showing weakness in their new efforts to keep the players to their side would insurance sick pay larger club grants and other items have excited such consideration from the union body if the players had not protested in the form of a new league your article mentions the fact that professionalism is beaten in the country but very strong in the city especially in balmain now if there is one club above all others that has a grievance against the union management it should be balmain can it be fairly said that birch grove park received its share of first grade matches why should certain clubs receive consideration as to playing grounds to illustrate more clearly why should south sydney club play so often on the sports ground and balmain make journeys nearly every play day to the local club's ground another matter i have not seen discussed is the umpiring question how comes it that one or two fortunate umpires can obtain all the best matches of the season to be brief what need is there of two rugby bodies such as the metropolitan and the new south wales rugby union could not one secretary in less expensive quarters than in bly street do all the work with ease this matter will not stand argument and until the various electorate clubs demand what is their right namely a balance sheet of the season showing full receipts and expenditure a protest such as is now put forward in the shape of a new league organization should merit public approval i am etc protest saturday fourteenth of march nineteen hundred and eight 
New South Wales Rugby League, Referees Association. A meeting of the referees to whistle the matches under the New South Wales Rugby League was held last night at the Supreme Court Hotel under the chairmanship of Mr T. Costello. The following officers were elected. President, Mr T. Hoyle. Vice-Presidents, Messrs. McCabe, Trumper, Burden, Giltinen, Messenger. Secretary, Mr. Aubrey C. Welsh. Treasurer, Mr. George Boss. Delegate to the Council, Mr. George Boss. General Committee, Messrs. Costello, Hooper, Henlon, Buchanan and Hansen. Examination Board, Messrs. Costello, McCabe, Hooper, Burden and Henlon. Auditors, Messrs. Knox and Trumper. It was stated that the league would have for its matches Wentworth Park, Agricultural Ground, Birch Grove, perhaps Hampden Park, and a ground in Newtown. Trial matches would be played on Hampden Park towards the end of the present month. It was stated that the New Zealanders would play five or six matches in Sydney, and that there would be a Maori team here as well as a team from Queensland. A New South Wales team would visit Brisbane. Mr. Boss stated that a very large number of juniors in North Sydney had decided to play league football. Clubs had been formed and were being formed to represent Balmain, Eastern Suburbs, Newtown, Western Suburbs, South Sydney, Glebe, North Sydney and another district. It was claimed that the prospects were bright. Wednesday 25th of March 1908 Football, South Sydney Club, Amateurism Defended Last night at St. David's Hall, Surrey Hills, the South Sydney Club held its annual meeting. The chair was occupied by Mr. R. C. Cole. Among those on the platform were several representatives of the New South Wales Rugby Union and the Metropolitan Union. Considerable enthusiasm was displayed. Several of the first grade team had represented the state in the interstate and international matches. The statements of receipts and expenditure showed a credit balance of £21, 6 shillings and tenpence. Feeling reference was also made in the report to the late Mr. A. G. Dent, and also to the late Mr. J. L. Groundwater of the University Club. The report was adopted. In speaking to the report, Mr. McMahon referred to the secession of some of the club members from the Metropolitan Union. He felt sorry for those who had left their ranks and amateurism, feeling aggrieved at what they thought the union had or had not done. The proper course was to wait until the annual meetings, and then appoint those men who could ventilate any grievances they might have, and thus eliminate any necessity for disunion or dissatisfaction. Instead of that, seceders had adopted an entirely different course. He would take the opportunity to absolutely deny the truth of an allegation reported to have been made by a certain alderman who had accused the union authorities of underhand practice. He, the speaker, was in a position, through long association with that body, to not only refute that allegation, but also to state that none of the management committee had ever, to his knowledge, received any compensation for services done. The attacks that had been made against the Union were without foundation. Hear, hear. Mr. H. D. Wood, President of the Metropolitan Union, speaking on the professional movement, said he was glad to say that the players and the general public were determined to maintain the rugby union. If professionalism once got a hold, there would be no room for the amateur. Mr. Mark stated that the balance sheet of the Metropolitan Union was the best answer to criticism. Mr. Forgey, Newcastle, stated that a couple of days ago a most successful meeting had been held in the northern city. Newcastle was going on the same lines as the rugby union. Country footballers recognised that they could not do without the Metropolitan Union. Thursday, 26th of March, 1908 Football, Metropolitan Rugby Union, Professional Movement, The Great Heart of the Public the annual meeting of the Metropolitan Rugby Union was held at the rooms last night, Mr. H. D. Wood occupying the chair. The annual report contained the following. During the course of the season, a number of players belonging to constituent clubs were dealt with for breaches of the rules as to professionalism. It was imperative in the interests of our national winter game that such action should have been taken, for there could be but one result were professionalism once allowed. 
the histories of the british football association and the english northern union show this unmistakably rugby would soon cease to be a game it would become a business in which there would be no room for any but the professional mr h d wood in moving the adoption of the report and balance sheet referred to the high standard of play last year they had got back to the standard of the eighteen ninety nine visit of the english team since their last annual meeting there was a big matter for regret and that was the beginning of professionalism the experience gained in great britain showed how undesirable it was it would undermine the game and spoil the young players he was however sure that the players in the metropolitan area would remain loyal to the amateur game it was gratifying to see the stand taken by the rowing and swimming associations mr e s marx quoted figures to show what money had been spent on the clubs the league had certainly caused the clubs to show more zeal he was personally in favour of a general definition of an amateur for all sports on the basis of an amateur conference definition mr mcmahon said that professionalism would deteriorate the game and he was sure the public would see that mr j f mcmanamy said that public sympathy would always be with those who showed the better honester and cleaner game the union stood on a basis of human confidence in each other why take any notice of the opposition mr w arnold said too much importance had been attached to the professional movement they had nothing to fear the great heart of the public always preferred clean sport as soon as you could hire a man to win a game you could hire a man to lose it there was no doubt that certain players would join the movement and it was just as well they should be out of the amateur ranks there was an idea that players drew the crowd they did not when messenger did not play last year there was a bigger crowd than when he did mr davoren thought the professional movement had built too high it had offered too big a programme in order to attract players and it would fail mr c w oakes m l a said the opposition movement had done good it had caused people to talk about the game and had stirred on the various clubs to action the public would stand to the game the union put before them the report and the balance sheet which showed a credit balance of two thousand eight hundred and fifty three pounds and sixpence were adopted unanimously friday twenty seventh of march nineteen hundred and eight balmain rugby league club the general meeting of the newly formed balmain rugby football club under the auspices of the new south wales league was held in the odd fellows hall darling street last night mr cecil turner presided addresses of a vigorous character were delivered by the chairman and mr harry hoyle president of the league and were received with great enthusiasm the election of officers resulted as follows patron Mr. Q. L. Deloitte, President, Mr. C. Turner, 20 Vice Presidents, On Secretary, Mr. R. Hutchison, On Treasurer, Mr. H. Laidlaw, Delegate to League, Mr. R. Hutchison, Committee, Messrs. Hargraves, F. O'Donnell, G. Wilcox, A. Fitzpatrick, J. Apolloni, A. Walker, T. Latter, H. Davis, F. Franklin. Monday, 30th of March, 1908 new south wales rugby union how to dish the league principles welcomed men tabooed as advertised the annual meeting of the new south wales rugby union will be held this evening at the rooms six bly street two important propositions will come before the meeting the result of the discussion upon which will be watched with a good deal of interest they are by mr jas mcmahon seconded by mr j r henderson a that steps be taken to insert in the bylaws of the union a bylaw providing for granting allowances to players representing the state incapacitated by being injured on the field of play and for defraying medical and other expenses caused through being incapacitated by any such injury while representing the state by mr jas mcmahon seconded by mr e s marks that in addition to the act of professionalism as provided for in clauses a to o in rule two section one and in clauses a to n in rule two section two this union in accordance with rule eleven of rules as to professionalism hereby declares as an act of professionalism 
holding any office or assisting in any manner whatsoever any rugby football association declared by this union to be formed in opposition to the new south wales rugby union in the state of new south wales to the editor of the herald sir the remarks of a w green and also those of mr arnold at the annual meeting of the metropolitan rugby union were most uncalled for mr green's remark that the names of gentlemen who had represented the state and gone over to the rugby league should have their names expunged from the roll of honour were certainly not the remarks of a true sporting gentleman already mr green has very few supporters and should after his recent utterances have none the public of new south wales can now see by the actions of these officials of the m r u who are the squeakers who is not going to suffer most by the advent of league football not the public but the officials who have had numerous picnics and trips at the expense of the m r u with money provided by players and public and now that the players are to get a few of the plums out of the game by connecting themselves with the rugby league how these officials of the m r u do squeal and squirm mr arnold stated at the same meeting that he was glad most of the players were going to stick to clean sport well why does not mr arnold say straight out that the league players and officials are not clean sports and give us a show to answer him i am sure the public by this time have found out who are the clean sports mr arnold stated that the attendance was larger in a match that mr messenger did not appear in official records will show such not to be the case i would like messrs green and arnold to know that the league of which i am proud to be a member is governed by gentlemen and true sports who would not allow utterances regarding players who have done yeoman service in the past for the state and australia such as messrs l green and arnold voiced at the annual meeting of the m r u already the players and referees who have left the ranks of the union have come to feel proud of being members of the league and that they made no mistake in leaving the ranks of the union i am etc george boss stanmore march twenty sixth new south wales league referees association tuesday thirty first of march nineteen hundred and eight hampden park at the paddington council last night a letter was read from the new south wales rugby league amending the tender for the use of hampden park for the nineteen hundred and eight season and allowing fifty per cent of the gross proceeds with a guarantee of not less than fourteen first grade matches the letter was received saturday fourth of april nineteen hundred and eight football preliminary matches will be played by the union the league and under the australian rules while under the british association code practice games will occupy attention rugby union eastern suburbs versus north sydney at three fifteen p m hampden oval second teams at two fifteen p m south sydney versus sydney rushcutter oval second teams at two fifteen p m university versus western suburbs sports ground second teams at two fifteen p m balmain versus glebe epping second teams two fifteen p m newtown versus st george at erskineville oval second teams two fifteen p m league newtown versus western suburbs at rosebury park north sydney versus glebe at rosebury park balmain possibles versus probables at birchgrove reserve eastern suburbs versus south sydney agricultural ground at three thirty eastern suburbs two versus south sydney two agricultural ground at two o'clock wednesday eighth of april nineteen hundred and eight amateur definition athletic conference rugby league claims a place rejected by twenty three to eleven in response to invitations from the new south wales amateur swimming association a conference was held in the sports club last night between representatives of various athletic bodies the chief object of the meeting being to frame a uniform amateur definition for the observance of all athletic bodies mr j taylor president of the swimming association occupied the chair mr e howes secretary of the swimming association was elected secretary a letter from the rugby league was read asking permission for its delegates to attend mr p b colquhoun 
moved that the rugby league should be requested to furnish evidence to the conference showing that it was entitled to be considered as an amateur organization before being admitted mr r hickson seconded the motion mr m a noble said before discussing such a motion they would have to determine what was an amateur mr richardson remarked that professional boxers who did no other work were to be seen playing as amateur footballers every week mr colquhoun withdrew his motion in favour of mr horniman who moved that the request of the league be not granted he quoted rules eleven and twelve of the league which stated that players might receive ten shillings a day for actual loss of time while playing football it was useless to commence the conference by any humbug mr a morrison seconded the motion mr noble urged that ten shillings was not too much to reimburse a player for expenses it was absurd for a man to participate in a game at personal loss he moved an amendment that the rugby league be admitted to the conference and have the same right to vote as the other associations mr hart seconded the amendment stating that the league claimed to be an amateur body and as the conference had not inquired into the constitutions of other bodies represented it should not particularise the league in that matter messrs a e nash murray pryor and j a payton supported the motion the motion was carried by twenty-three votes to eleven it was eventually decided that a subcommittee of seven be formed to prepare a series of resolutions for future conference the committee elected was messrs taylor swimming association marks athletic union horniman rowing colquhoun tennis arnold university sports union mcmahon rugby union and green cricket association each association was requested to forward a copy of its rules to the subcommittee and the meeting adjourned till may the fifth friday tenth of april nineteen hundred and eight all blacks back a successful trip dividend about two hundred and fifty pounds the new zealand professional footballers after their tour to the northern counties of england arrived in sydney yesterday by the r m s mongolia on their way home they will remain in australia long enough possibly to play matches at sydney and brisbane on their arrival at the wharf they were met by messrs j j giltonen v trumper h miller h hoyle and g boss representing the new south wales football league rugby all the all blacks have returned except todd who will play for wigan where for the new zealand match there was an attendance of forty five thousand gleeson who is said to be going in for law mcgregor who has entered into business and g smith who will play for oldham and lavery messenger the hero of the tour has increased in weight from eleven stone to thirteen stone and is in excellent health he says he had quite a large number of offers to play with north of england clubs one of the players laughed when he heard that it was stated they had made about a hundred and fifty pound each out of the trip he would not say how much their dividend was but it was indirectly gathered to be somewhere between two hundred and fifty pounds and three hundred pounds the amount will be supplemented by the matches to be played before the team disbands the players speak highly of their trip they were treated well everywhere the weather conditions were against their play and also interfered with the takings it was possible to pick out one or two teams in the previous new zealand tour stronger than any the present team were called upon to meet but as a whole the matches this season were much harder this is the opinion of johnston one of the best forwards of the side who also says that everything turned out more satisfactory than was anticipated heavy rain for weeks however made the ground sodden and the condition of the turf was in a measure responsible for some of their defeats the team will be tendered a formal welcome at the town hall on monday night messenger is to receive a welcome home at ferndale hall Willara, on saturday evening monday thirteenth of april nineteen hundred and eight dally messenger northern the better game a speculator not a professional dally messenger of rugby fame who returned to sydney on thursday with the all blacks was out in his launch upon the harbour on saturday afternoon we had a great time and they treated us very well he said regarding his english trip the northern union men are a good set of players trained to the day 
the secretaries or managers of the different clubs are very strict especially with regard to liquor the players are not allowed to drink and if they are found doing so they are dropped for a fortnight how do they compare with the new zealanders for physique on the whole i consider the new zealanders better built men i don't consider the northern union rules with only thirteen men aside accounted for any of the defeats as the new zealanders had trained a lot under these conditions before leaving for england the thirteen team always means hard playing from start to finish you never know the result until the whistle blows a team might be fourteen points ahead of you in the first half and fourteen points behind you in the second you've got to play hard until the last moment and in scrum formation we played four two instead of the old style of three two three i think this new game under northern union rules with thirteen men aside is the better game it's hotter from a player's point of view and it's a better game for the onlookers it's a splendid game to watch always fast and a man has to get into tip-top nick to play it i don't know how they are shaping at it here it takes some getting into i usually played five-eighth at the beginning of the tour but was wing three-quarter most of the time i played full-back in one match in wales question regarding the probable effects of the rugby league upon the football of the state and the possibility of an ultimate settlement of the differences existing between the rugby union and the new league messenger replied all i can say is that i am going to stick to the league i know nothing of the state of affairs and so cannot say anything on being asked if he had heard the rumour to the effect that he had received payment from the amateur body in connection with his trip to queensland last year messenger said it's all rot for people to say that i received money in queensland i never received money for playing then nor have i yet done so even on this last trip we were certain amount each it was a speculation and we had to work mighty hard to make it a good one i believe i am classed as a professional though as i once tried to join the amateur swimmers and was kept out owing to the fact that i had won a race in a canoe a special welcome to messenger was given at ferndale hall woolera on saturday evening when a presentation was made to him tuesday fourteenth of april nineteen hundred and eight messenger and the all blacks reception at the town hall a large crowd assembled at the town hall last night on the occasion of a public reception to dally messenger and the all blacks on their return from their english tour mr h c hoyle president of the new south wales rugby league who occupied the chair extended to the all blacks a hearty welcome back to australian soil and a special welcome to dally messenger the only australian of the team he hoped they would shortly see messenger in all his brilliance upon the football field cheers were given for the all blacks mr wright the captain of the team in replying said the team had a good reception in england they had learned many lessons on the tour and one of these was that the old amateur rugby game was not the only game in the world he was sure the public would flock to see the new league game messenger had made lifelong friendships in england his goal-kicking was marvellous and he did not think there was a player in england who could kick goals like him he was glad to say the new zealanders would have him when they played at newcastle mr messenger thanked the audience briefly for their reception and the team of the all blacks then mounted the platform and gave vent to their war cry which proved so popular with the crowds in the northern counties during the evening a programme of songs and recitations and an exhibition of leisure de man was appreciated by the audience thursday sixteenth of april nineteen hundred and eight the rugby union prospects of the season the biggest on record is the prognostication concerning the season for nineteen hundred and eight there are teams coming from great britain and new zealand and the greatest of all in the football history of new south wales or australia according to its personnel is the dispatch of a team to great britain football has been more talked about since the various disquieting influences at the end of last season and the result is that an exceptional season as far as public interest is concerned is about to be commenced players were never keener clubs have never worked harder there are the same number of senior clubs and despite a few defections from last year's teams 
they appear from the standard of play already shown to compare favourably with last year's the season as controlled by the metropolitan union will begin on saturday next there have been no transfers by removal of residence the trial games indicate that the four strongest clubs will be glebe university south sydney and newtown eastern suburbs have a lot of new men and so have balmain north sydney will be strengthened by players from the city and suburban association all round there is a big increase in the number of aspirants to first grade teams and consequently selectors will have a difficult task particularly in the south sydney balmain and sydney districts newtown will be strengthened by booth the ex new zealander and sydney by officers of the fleet who are eligible for selection extraordinary interest is being taken in the local compositions the places of the men who have gone over to the professional ranks have been filled by players of promise the one man who will be most missed is messenger who would however be a champion in any position and perhaps in any football game the premier club of the metropolitan union glebe will meet the leading brisbane club at brisbane and there is a possibility of the ponsonby club auckland coming for a trip to sydney End of part nine. Part ten of the birth of professional rugby league in Australia. Selections from the Sydney Morning Herald, nineteen hundred and seven to nineteen hundred and eight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The New South Wales Rugby League. The first season opens eighteenth of april to twenty first of april nineteen hundred and eight saturday the eighteenth of april nineteen hundred and eight the winter sports with the precious ashes firmly returned to our possession we can look back with satisfaction to the cricket season which formerly closed a week ago there may have been other times when our men have played more convincingly even as against an appreciably better english combination but there have been few seasons in which the cricket interest has been more intense with us however game treads hot on the heels of game and to-day we have the opening of the football season stuffed with more promise of exciting play than any that has preceded it the very richness of the programme is a witness to the extraordinary strides which football has made in popular favour during the last few years it seems but yesterday it was a serious game only in sydney and a few of the larger provincial centres to-day there is not a town and scarcely a country village which has not its club and its goal-posts among the schools it might even be possible to find more footballers than cricketers but the game is mostly rugby the efforts to popularise the british association game and the australian game which by the way has a gathering of its clans in victoria this winter though they cannot be said to have been without result have had a result which is small comparatively this conquering march of the more strenuous and bone endangering form of the game may cause those who like to take their sport in milder and more seemly way to grieve not a little but so long as people really play the more strenuous if rougher game we may rather congratulate ourselves than otherwise that the choice has fallen as it has this season however we are to have a surfeit of big events the redoubtable all blacks play here again and were there no other attraction we can conceive that their visit alone would ensure a season of entertainment new zealand however is also sending us a maori professional team and an amateur university representation on top of this we are to have the english amateurs after they have played through their programme of matches in new zealand add the interstate and country matches and we have surely a stimulating prospect we may contemplate the incoming of the host of opponents from without the state with much less apprehension than would have been possible a short time ago our standard of play has been gradually improving and we can fairly hope that the results of our meetings with the new zealand and english teams will prove how great the improvement has been we have however to take into account the new element of professionalism which has crept into the sport this year the lately formed new south wales league may deny that it exists to foster professionalism 
but the public will scarcely appreciate the distinction which it draws between compensation to players for loss of time and straight-out remuneration for their services. Professionalism has killed every other sport it has touched. As everyone knows, it killed sculling, a sport which in the days of beach drew bigger crowds than ever football or cricket has done since, and it killed running and cycling. Whether football will escape unscathed remains to be seen. It is too new a development, both here and in New Zealand, to enable us yet to judge of the effect. But the odds are heavily in favour of its being harmful. When professionalism comes in at the door, the spirit of sport generally prepares to fly out of the window. While amateurism holds the preponderating place in the game, however, the immediate effect of the professional intrusion will most probably be to quicken rivalry and provide those who take their sport vicariously with more exciting entertainments. That, however, is quite a different thing from furthering the sport of rugby football as a national game. Our winter programme, however, does not end with football, of whatever variety. We shall have played, off and on, an Australian court, the Davis Cup final, the blue ribbon event of international tennis. That this should happen so is sufficient evidence of the important place which tennis now holds in our repertory of games. Tennis is one of the few outdoor games in which women are practically on an equality with men, and for this reason, if no other, its growth in popularity is a welcome development. The less familiar games of hockey, hurling and lacrosse bravely maintain their struggle for acclimatisation, and while it cannot be said they are making any astonishing progress, they have each their little circle of devotees, who determinedly cherish a hope of more appreciation in years to come. Then we have the dignified and leisurely game of bowls, a game not for giddy-pated youth, but for citizens of girth and years and worship. The winter is to see innumerable inter-club matches of importance, not to speak of the momentous contests between Victoria and New South Wales and New Zealand. Above all and beyond all, there is the transcendent game of golf, which is still not a game, but a sacred rite and while the general population is perspiring over the more lowly forms of exercise and recreation, the elect of golf will be put in wickedly on a thousand greens. There is national comfort in the thought. Football, local competitions. The season will open today for Metropolitan Union matches. The league will play scratch engagements. The season proper opening on Monday. Scratch matches will be played also today by the Australian Rules League and British Association. The fixtures are League Rugby, 1st grade, Glebe vs Western Suburbs at Wentworth Park, 3 o'clock, Referee, Mr F Henlon, Balmain vs Newtown at Birch Grove Oval, 3.15 o'clock, Referee, Mr Hooper, Eastern Suburbs vs North Sydney at Birch Grove, 2 o'clock, Referee, Mr G Boss. South Sydney vs Newcastle at Wentworth Park, 3.15 o'clock. Referee Mr T. Costello. Second grade, Newtown vs Balmain at Birch Grove, 2 o'clock. Eastern Suburbs vs North Sydney at Birch Grove at 3.15. Glebe vs Western Suburbs at Rosebury Park at 3.15. South Sydney vs Enfield at Botany at 3 o'clock. Third grade, Sydney vs Balmain at Birch Grove at 3.15 Eastern Suburbs vs North Sydney at North Sydney Oval at 3 o'clock Glebe vs Newtown at Rosebury Park at 2 o'clock South Sydney vs Dremoyne at Botany 2 o'clock First Class and First Grade Fixtures The following are the First Class and First Grade Fixtures for the season Royal Agricultural Shield April 20th Glebe vs Newcastle, Wentworth Park, Eastern Suburbs vs Newtown, Wentworth Park, Balmain vs Western Suburbs, Birchgrove Park, South Sydney vs North Sydney, Birchgrove Park. April 25th, Newtown vs Glebe, Western Suburbs vs South Sydney, North Sydney vs Balmain, Newcastle vs Eastern Suburbs. May the 2nd, All Black vs New South Wales, Sydney. May 6th, all Black vs New South Wales, Sydney. May 9th, All Black vs Australia, Sydney. May 16th, Glebe vs North Sydney, Eastern Suburbs vs Western Suburbs, 
Balmain versus Newtown, South Sydney versus Newcastle. May 23rd, Eastern Suburbs versus North Sydney, Balmain versus Newcastle, Glebe versus Western Suburbs, South Sydney versus Newtown. May 30th, Glebe versus South Sydney, Balmain versus Eastern Suburbs, Newcastle versus Newtown, North Sydney versus Western Suburbs, All Black versus Australia, Sydney, Maori versus New South Wales. June 6th, All Black versus Australia, Sydney. June 8th, Maori versus New South Wales. June 10th, Maori versus New South Wales. June 13th, Maori versus New South Wales. June 20th, Balmain versus Glebe, South Sydney versus Eastern Suburbs, Newcastle versus North Sydney, Western Suburbs versus Newtown. June 27th, Glebe versus Eastern Suburbs, South Sydney versus Balmain, Newcastle versus Western Suburbs, Newtown versus North Sydney. Second round. July 4th, Glebe versus Newcastle, Eastern Suburbs versus Newtown, Balmain versus Western Suburbs, South Sydney versus North Sydney. July 8th, New South Wales versus Queensland, Sydney. July 11th, New South Wales versus Queensland, Sydney. July 18th, Eastern Suburbs versus Newcastle, Newtown versus Glebe, Western Suburbs versus South Sydney, North Sydney versus Balmain. July 25th, Maori versus New South Wales, August 1st, Maori versus New South Wales, August 3rd, Maori versus New South Wales. August 15th, Glebe versus North Sydney, Eastern Suburbs versus Western Suburbs, Balmain versus Newtown, South Sydney versus Newcastle. August 22nd, Eastern Suburbs versus North Sydney, Balmain versus Newcastle, Glebe versus Western Suburbs, South Sydney versus Newcastle. August 29th, Glebe versus South Sydney, Balmain versus Eastern Suburbs, Newcastle versus Newtown, North Sydney versus Western Suburbs. September 5th, Balmain versus Glebe, South Sydney versus Eastern Suburbs, Newcastle versus North Sydney. Western Suburbs versus Newtown. September 12th, Glebe versus Eastern Suburbs, South Sydney versus Balmain, Newcastle versus Western Suburbs, Newtown versus North Sydney. Tuesday, 21st of April, 1908. Football, New South Wales League, opening of the season, some of the features. Yesterday the season for the league opened with some first grade matches and a mixed lot of players. The chief features in the play as distinct from rugby were that there was very little kicking for the boundary, finding the line as it is called. It was generally to the player's advantage to keep the ball in the field, although boundaries were admissible from penalty kicks. When players punted over the side boundaries, except by penalty kicks, the ball was recalled to the place kicked from and a scrum formed. There was consequently no line-out and throw-in. When the ball went out accidentally, or a player ran out with it or was forced out, a scrum ten yards from the spot in the field of play was formed. Charging an opponent about to take a mark was prohibited, the penalty for infringement of this rule being a free kick. Charges were not allowed at free kicks either, nor were the defenders permitted to rush out when a ball was placed to disconcert a probable goal-kicker. They were also not permitted to jump up or extend their hands to try to touch the ball in its flight from a place kick. All they could do was to stand two or three in a line at the mark and spread themselves with their backs to the kicker and their elbows stuck out. After a try had been scored but no goal followed, the ball was brought out to centre and drop kicked. If a goal was scored, the ball was placed and kicked from centre as in old rugby. When a man was tackled with the ball in his possession, he had to put the ball down and play it with his feet, if he could. Lifting the feet in the scrum was penalised by free kicks, and no break from the scrum was allowed by either side till the ball was clear. In placing the ball in the scrums, it had to be thrown in from shoulder high, not placed in underhand or lobbed in. When the ball was forced, a 25-yard punt or drop kick was allowed to the side forcing. The knock-on was liberally construed. If a man knocked on in the air and then caught the ball, he was allowed to go on with it, so long as it did not touch the ground. 
generally speaking the players yesterday showed that they had become conversant with the new rules which certainly make a game between two good teams open and fast with scrums only a second or two in duration the eastern suburbs and newtown teams gave a capital display but the latter were absolutely to a standstill at the finish the game between glebe and newcastle was of far inferior quality although there were some capital players on each side agricultural shield and medals newtown versus eastern suburbs played on wentworth park and won by eastern suburbs by thirty two points to sixteen about three thousand persons witnessed the game teams newtown hereford back burdett scott cheadle and fairbairn three quarters manton and macfarlane halves hamel noble courtney mackintosh williams powell forwards eastern suburbs fry back stunt smith brown and frawley three quarters rosenfelt and dalpuget halves mabel jones o'malley brackenrig pierce and flegg forwards mr e hooper referee newtown won the toss and played with the sun behind them from the kick-off the game was fast eastern suburbs rushed the ball to the newtown line but the defenders repulsed the assault and carried the ball into eastern suburbs territory excellent dribbling by newtown and quick work along the wing by a newtown three-quarter puzzled the easterners and scott securing at centre dodged fast through the pack and scored behind the posts he added the goal points himself newtown five points eastern suburbs nil from centre eastern suburbs assumed the offensive and mabel darted off with smith in close attendance smith took the pass and scored near the posts dalpuget added the goal points five all this success was followed by another score for east dalpuget getting a try on the wing no goal was added eastern suburbs eight to five points manton made a brilliant run from his quarter for newtown but his pass was mulled and frawley saved the play was full of merit all the men being fully extended scott was in splendid form for newtown and proved himself a top-notcher the scrum work was quick newtown being the cleverer from the break-up at one stage after an even spell frawley flegg rosenfelt and stunts were participants in a fine passing rush stunts getting across the line easily rosenfelt failed at goal eastern suburbs eleven to five a weak kick out of bounds by fry caused his side some trouble but after a spell on the defensive the easterners cleared their line only to find it again assaulted william scored a fine try for newtown and scott added the goal points eastern suburbs eleven points newtown ten points subsequent play was extremely fast smith of the easterners injured his shoulder and retiring miller took his place burdett also retired from newtown's side and hunger filled the vacancy in play after the spell dalpuget secured and passed to stunts who raced for the line and running round behind it scored a try which jones converted eastern suburbs sixteen newtown ten a great dribble by three newtown men was stopped by fry shortly afterwards brown for east broke away and scored a try which brackenrig failed to convert eastern suburbs nineteen to ten newtown began to show symptoms of distress the pace having been a cracker dalpuget rosenfelt and stunts passed well and the fast runner again beat all opposition and scored near the posts brown missed the goal eastern suburbs twenty two to ten a rally by newtown was effective scott again scoring for them but hereford failed to add the goal points eastern suburbs twenty two newtown thirteen stunts scored another try for east and jones converted eastern suburbs twenty seven newtown thirteen miller was the next to add a try for east after taking a short pass from fry stunts missed the goal eastern suburbs thirty newtown thirteen miller kicked a field goal for east placing the eastern men nineteen points in the lead newtown were practically run to a standstill and even men who had free kicks did not follow up their weak efforts manton was the solitary exception for his side after a couple of dashes finding his passes were not taken he secured and dodging six opponents scored behind the posts cheadle's kick was a failure stunts and a newtown player came to blows and brown separated them 
three onlookers jumped over the fence to come to the aid of the new town men and play was stopped till they retired the game ended shortly afterwards with the score eastern suburbs thirty two newtown sixteen glebe versus newcastle these teams met on wentworth park glebe winning an indifferent exhibition by eight points to five teams glebe prendergast back edwards ryan ogard and wright three quarters davis and holloway five eighths burden moroni pierce moyer venus and mccabe forwards newcastle smith back bailey mcginnis and coleman three quarters patfield scrum half hardy and lawson five eighths bartley carpenter croft nicholson kay and richardson forwards mr t costello referee glebe had the sun in their faces for the first half and the play like the preceding one became very fast from the kick-off too fast to last on the hot day newcastle opened the scoring a rattling piece of work in which lawson croft and bailey figured ended in the last name dropping across the line although tackled and scoring near the corner flag mcginnis made a good kick at goal which however added no points newcastle three glebe nil k of newcastle had a finger broken and had to retire his place being taken by e smith lively work by both teams elicited cheers glebe had the better of it at the finish but burden dropped the ball near the line and a good scoring position was turned into a force by newcastle scrums were frequent but none were of longer duration than about six seconds after repeated assaults on the newcastle line davis got across for glebe and scored a try which ogard failed to convert glebe had made four ineffectual attempts to kick goals from places each succeeding one being worse than its predecessor glebe three newcastle three ogard secured from a pass out to the wing and centering to venus the latter scored a try which moyer converted amid cheers and laughter glebe eight newcastle three towards the end of the first half the game slowed somewhat and there was some disposition to talk amongst the players the half ended with the scores unaltered newcastle resumed with a man short after the spell but their pack was very willing and their scrum worker got the ball neatly away to his backs time after time at intervals the northerners passing was clean and timely for lifting the feet in the scrum glebe were penalised but both teams frequently offended in this direction and the ball was generally put into the scrum incorrectly a complete lack of brilliancy characterised this half glebe especially failing to show the requisite cohesion bailey kicked a penalty goal for newcastle to liven matters up there was a whistle fantasia during the play but it was necessary as the players often broke rules or scrums were required newcastle for holding a man down were penalised but the glebe kick went under the bar the northerners played up well but the quality of play was below expectation generally glebe had to defend for a few minutes and a free being given against them bailey had a kick which just went outside a post rallying glebe took the ball to the other end where there was an exhilarating scramble and much of the play of the wildest possible description newcastle cleared their line and the game ended with the scores unaltered south sydney versus north sydney played on birch grove park in the presence of a fair number of spectators and won by south sydney by eleven to seven teams south sydney a conlin fullback f jarman e fry f storey t anderson three quarters a butler j levison half backs a hennessy j cochran j rosewell j davis r green h butler forwards north sydney w whitfield fullback w drummond j devereux j matheson w mccarthy three quarters s dean m lyons half backs d luke h glanville f notting e boland j kendall j cost forwards mr g boss was referee north sydney won the toss and chose the northern end rosewell kicked off for south sydney but the ball was returned and for a time souths were on the defensive for a breach of the rules south were penalised and glanville made no mistake north sydney two to nil from a scrum a penalty was given against north and h butler from over half-way kicked a splendid goal making the scores even 
play continued fast and south sydney from a free had an easy chance of scoring but butler failed although the attempt was by no means a bad one an easy chance was given to glanville to score from a mark but he missed badly and play was transferred to the north's territory the game continued fast and even until south sydney pressing anderson succeeded in getting over the line a butler failed at goal south sydney five to two the half-time whistle sounded soon afterwards soon after play was resumed notting secured and made a splendid run but was brought down after a hard struggle then lutcher obtained and got across the attempt at goal failed scores five all north sydney were kept on the defensive for some time and their goal was in danger several times until a good dribble by the forwards gave relief another rush by south sydney ended in green scoring the goal points were not added south sydney eight to five north pressed hard and from a free kick glanville sent up the red flag south sydney eight north sydney seven from a scrum h butler received the ball and scored but the attempt at goal failed the full-time whistle went immediately afterwards south sydney winning a capital game by eleven to seven balmain versus western suburbs played on birch grove park and won by balmain by twenty four to nil balmain j regent fullback g wilcox fitzpatrick a walker t latter three quarters t o'donnell a bryant half backs t apolloni t mcfadden w fisher a dobbs a ward r graves forwards western suburbs g duffin full back blake b duggan t phelan p franks three quarters r gormley l gormley half backs j abercrombie t mount j stack e mead w elliot a brown forwards mr seabrook referee the game opened in very lively fashion both sides showing great willingness and the ball travelled up and down the ground with great rapidity from a scrum in western suburbs twenty five balmain secured and after some splendid passing latter secured and got across after a clever dodging run the attempt at goal failed balmain three to nil for illegal play balmain were penalised and elliot had the kick but the ball went wide balmain kept western suburbs on the defensive and from a scrum in the latter's corner graves secured and fell across the line latter failed at goal balmain six to nil exciting play followed balmain having the advantage but they missed an easy chance to score from a free kick right in front of their opponent's goal at half time the score was unaltered on resuming balmain had their opponents on the defensive play being mostly centred in the vicinity of western suburbs goals from a scrum latter obtained and dodging the western suburbs backs scored latter took the kick himself but failed to add the goal points balmain nine to nil soon afterwards graves got another try and latter kicked the goal balmain fourteen to nil wilcox a little later scored yet another try and latter converted balmain nineteen to nil another goal for balmain was scored by fitzpatrick who also added the extras balmain thus won by twenty four to nil end of part ten end of the birth of professional rugby league in australia read by phil benson in sydney australia